The first question I'd like to pose to, to Mr. Gleeson is the idea that justice is not simply concerned with the determination of the law and its application to a particular history, but that justice, this, this imperative of justice, has to do also with the idea that law must be implemented. And, uh, and whilst a king could certainly expedite justice, it's harder sometimes for a, a judiciary which sits together with other departments of state, such as an executive and a parliament. So Mr. Gleason has spoken in, in some of his speeches about justice as the outcome of this jo of the, of a joint process of the executive, the judicial, and, 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 and the legislature, which should have mutually respectful relationships. But I'm interested to hear how he understands uh, that, uh, how he understands the, the role of a justice system actually pursuing the implementation of justice. Um, Mr. Gleason sought in many ways to reduce delay in the courts. Is this the main way, and are there other ways for a, a, for a justice system to pursue the implementation of justice, and in other words, to see that society keep its laws? Um, I'm honored to Bigley this evening, um, and in particular we're here with Rabbi Khan, whose works I've been familiar with over uh, a number of years. The idea of a level of justice over and above the positive law, which judges have to enforce and implement, has some attractions and some aspects about which uh, judges would have certain reservations. Evident, self-evidently, a system of justice isn't working. And, and, and secondly, the question of parity amongst litigants. Um, I can set Rabbi Cowan's mind at rest to some extent in relation to speeding tickets and the form of uh, penalty that is for public convenience, and I think generally rightly for public convenience, uh, applied by on the spot fines. When that happens to you, you're always given the opportunity to refuse to pay the on-the-spot fine and to take the matter to court. And if the matter goes to court, then the prosecution will bear the onus of proving beyond reasonable doubt that you were the driver of the car or that you were traveling at an excessive speed or whatever is the issue. That's the way the system seeks to reconcile uh, the issues that have been mentioned. But we all know that there are many forms of civil action that can have far more serious consequences for the defendant than conviction for a speeding offence. Uh, there are allegations that are made daily in civil action that are far graver than the allegations that are made in some kinds uh, of penal action. If a doctor is alleged to be guilty of professional negligence, the effect of success in that claim upon him and his future livelihood and professional reputation can be far more serious than the effect of being convicted for a speeding offence or for going through a red light. And yet, in the latter case, the onus of proof is beyond reasonable doubt, and in the former case, the onus of proof is on a balance of probabilities. And nobody pretends that the seriousness of an allegation made in a criminal action is necessarily greater than the seriousness of an allegation made in a civil action. But the system of justice, uh, provides different standards of proof, uh, and this is one reason for the popularity of this intermediate kind of action, an action for a civil penalty. 
it suits the prosecuting authorities or the, the public authorities to bring proceedings for a civil penalty in many circumstances where they don't want to bear the burden of complying with a criminal standard of proof. But I think it ought to be acknowledged that it also suits the defendants in those actions in many cases for the matter to be treated as an action for a civil penalty rather than a criminal prosecution. To take, as a, to take an obvious example, the administration of corporations law now involves extensive use of the civil penalty, of an action for a civil penalty, and that suits the authorities, the regulatory authorities, but in my experience it also suits many of the people who are alleged to have contravened the corporation's law also. They would feel much more comfortable uh, in an action to recover a civil penalty than they would in a criminal action. I don't accept that circumstantial evidence is necessarily less powerful than the evidence of eyewitnesses, for example, which might be very unreliable. And in terms of reliability of witnesses, uh, we're all familiar with some legal systems that grade the reliability of witnesses, amongst other things, according to their sex. So various legal systems have had approaches to the reliability of evidence, to the number of witnesses you need to call to establish a particular allegation, for example, that vary from place to place. But I think there is a fairly universal distinction between the administration of criminal justice and the uh, administration of civil justice. The, the second aspect of the question that has been raised refers to what is sometimes called the equality, the Americans call the equality of arms. We all know that in any adversarial system, uh, there'll be some people whose financial or other resources equip them better to conduct the adversarial contest. <coughs> uh, this inequality of arms isn't limited to justice systems that are described as adversarial, as distinct from what are sometimes called inquisitorial systems. Uh, in the interests of justice, our system seeks to minimize it by providing legal aid, but legal aid is something that depends on public funding and public funding raises issues of prioritizing uh, the application of scarce resources. As a practical matter in Australia, legal aid is fairly widely available to people who are accused of criminal offenses. Now that might include a rich drug trafficker, or at least a successful drug trafficker. <laughs> um, they don't all necessarily make full disclosure of their means. <laughs> and it might mean that legal aid, for example, is quite difficult to obtain for people who are engaged in family law disputes. And that can work quite hardship because, for obvious reasons, the parties to family law disputes are often uh, unevenly matched in terms of financial or other resources. But an effective and fair legal aid system is the best way that is so far, the best method that has so far been devised of dealing with this problem of inequality of arms. Widening the provision of legal aid doesn't seem to be a very popular political issue. You see political parties competing with one another to be tougher in relation to what they call law and order, but I haven't seen much competition between political parties to widen the availability of legal aid. Fortunately, I have to say, politicians, in my experience, aren't uh, moved exclusively by the popularity, considerations of popularity of particular issues, and I think the major political parties in our country do have an appreciation of the 
uh, importance of legal aid. On the unfortunate problem of the law and order option that frequently accompanies elections uh, here, uh, it, it was good to see that in the last state election in New South Wales, I think both of the major parties backed off uh, from that. Uh, that kind of hairy chested approach to the funding and administration of criminal justice um, is unattractive and unproductive. There is in New South Wales a Bureau of Crime Statistics and Dr. Weatherburn, who's been the head of that bureau for many years, from time to time reminds people publicly of some of the misinformation that is behind those law and order campaigns. For example, a lot of people, particularly elderly people, feel threatened by violence and are easily persuaded uh, that they are at grave risk when they walk the streets or, or lie in their beds. But Dr. Weatherburn has pointed out that statistically, the section of the community that are the principal victims of violence is identical with the section of the community that are the principal perpetrators of violence. They're very easily identified. They're males between the ages of 15 and 25. If you want to know why that is, you should speak to somebody who breeds horses or cattle. <laughs> the next question um, is an opportunity for Mr. Gleason to elaborate the point which you already began to make at the beginning, which is the way I suppose in which um, universal ethics are there to inform the, inter the application and interpretation of positive law. In other words, I'm sure everybody knows roughly what the positive law being the notion of law made by humans, made by legislatures, and so on and so forth, by societies, which is what happens is a great bulk of conventional law which is, which is developed. But there are also, there's this concept of universal ethics, and there is an intersection between them, and that one does not necessarily exclude the other, because every society evolves its own set of practices and laws. The interesting question, though, is how that is arbitrated by considerations of universal ethical principles. And um, uh, I'm most interested to, to read an essay of uh, Mr. Gleason about on statutory interpretation, which he spoke about some of the concerns. <coughs> uh, it did seem to me personally, actually, that uh, in some ways perhaps the famous battle between the argument between the uh, between the merits of uh, judicial legalism versus judicial activism may not really be so pertinent here because uh, one of these arguments says, look, uh, you know, is more inclined to find uh, justice in, in, the, in the law as it stands, or at least it pays more homage to the law as it stands. The other says no. The other is reflecting, the other is appealing to, to abstract principles. But the problem is that bad law could be in the law of the state. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, after all, Hitler and Stalin also had judges, and they introduced a lot of very bad law. And uh, but, but by the same token, an activist judge, in in seeking to uh, remedy the law according to some rule, he may also get it wrong. I mean, who says that that individual's principles are are, are better? So the question really is, I suppose, is how we how we access uh, some notion of of, of truth uh, and, and, and universality in values. And this question actually um, interested me very much when uh, I was involved with others in, uh, in, in struggles which went on in Victoria, a very torrid legislative session, uh, season in 2008, in which we saw a number of bills come in, which caused great controversy. At all events, it occurred to me that, that in many ways, a public which can have a, an open dis discussion, an open debate, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is, is, a, is an arena in which over the course of time, certain, certain 
objective and universal values will incur. And my own personal understanding, the reason for this is that I believe the human being possesses a soul. And this soul is actually ultimately something, as we say, the Bible is made in the image of God. It's able, it resonates ultimately with certain divine, universal values. And that's why history comes back to these values, even though there are times when we seem to be veering far away from it. And similarly also, a judge who is, uh, who is an exemplary uh, human being, a learned, humble person, is also uh, an instrument for, if you like, reaching, uh, accessing these universal principles, principles which have been crystallized from history, principles which, are, which resonate with the human, with human spirit. We have, it's, Mr. Mr. Gleason mentioned the case of, of Fiji, we spoke of We've spoken also about totalitarian regimes, but there are also laws which upset many in our own society, even though we could argue we have, a, we have good laws, but uh, a democracy in Sweden, for example, has produced a law for permitting incestuous marriage between half siblings. Many people are upset about a recent law which came in Victoria compelling uh, doctors to either administer an abortion or refer to another where they have a strong conscientious objection to it. At all events, the question I, the question I have here is, uh, is to, to Mr. Gleason is, basically, how, can, how, how, how will this process of mediation of uh, positive law by um, reference to universal ethics uh, proceed. How, in fact, does the law go about the task of identifying values? In its content, the common law and statutes were enacted by Commonwealth and state parliaments in Australia is full of values of the kind that Rabbi Cowan has mentioned. And it is amazing and sometimes alarming to see how little that aspect of the law is appreciated. Rabbi Cowan referred to a Swedish law on the subject of marriage, and that provides a good example of what is already in the law and the astonishing absence of public reflection upon how and why it got there. We have a Marriage Act of the Commonwealth that contains a definition of marriage as the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others voluntarily entered into for life. And just reflect upon a couple of aspects of that definition. There is an interpretation act that says that the singular includes the plural and the plural includes the singular. <laughs> but a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others plainly excludes polygamy. Where did that come from? Well now there's another provision in a statute that is practically unmentioned. In any discussion about changes of the law with respect to marriage, I should have thought it was the elephant in the room. Believe it or not, the Family Law Act, 1975 of the Commonwealth, declares that marriage is an institution and that the Family Law Court is obliged to have regard to the need to preserve and protect the institution of marriage as the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others voluntarily entered into for life. So the Commonwealth Parliament has declared 
that marriage, as defined in the Marriage Act, is an institution that needs to be preserved and protected. Again, where did that come from? Well, the answer as a matter of history is obvious. Until the 19th century, family law, the law of what we would call divorce and other aspects, was not administered by the common law courts in England, it was administered by the ecclesiastical courts, the church courts. And that definition of marriage and recognition of marriage as an institution came into our law from Rome in the days when it was the church and the ecclesiastical courts that administered that aspect of the law. And the Roman church took it from Judaic tradition and the Judeo-Christian approach to marriage has entered into our law and is now described as an institution that needs to be preserved and protected. Now, Professor Patrick Parkinson at Sydney University has recently produced a report that you'll see uh, referred to in newspaper articles about that question of the inst preserving and protecting the institution of marriage. But how often do you hear reference to that provision of the Family Law Act in the context of proposals to change the definition of marriage in the Marriage Act? Let me take one aspect of that definition of marriage that I mentioned earlier. A man and a woman exclusively. There are societies in which polygamy is currently practiced extensively and many people from those societies are now coming to Australia. If polygamists were a more active political force, then people would be forced to have another look at the definition of the institution of marriage and to ask where those values come from and what in those values may be threatened if the nature of the institution is altered. That seems to me to provide a textbook example of a value that has come into our law and that is not widely appreciated. Many of our values have come into law from religious sources. The respect for human life, uh, again, is a, a, an obvious example. Because of the decline in the influence of organized religion, which is the biggest single change that I have observed in society in my lifetime, people now seek alternative sources for much the same values. G.K. Chesterton said that when people stop believing in God, they don't start believing in nothing, they start believing in anything. And other religions, or other quasi-religious uh, beliefs, <coughs> for many people have supplanted religion as the source of their values. The human rights movement, again, is the most obvious example. Perhaps the conservation movement is another example. But in declarations of human rights, you find the same appeals to universal values. The American Declaration of Independence begins with a statement of universal values that looks like a statement written by natural lawyers. We know as a matter of historical fact that the authors of that document were not believers in natural law. 
We know that the people who said it's self-evident that all men are born equal owned as slaves. But they began their declaration of, human, uh, 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 declaration of independence with an appeal to universal law because the Declaration of Independence is framed as an indictment against the King of England. And it makes allegations of contravention of universal principles of law by those who had authority to administer the positive law. Why did they do that? Well, if you are a revolutionary, what else can you do? If you've overthrown the legitimate government and you are appealing to the universal community, to the world, for recognition of your legitimacy, you have to base your legitimacy on something, and they based it on what looked like declarations of natural, principles of natural law, or declarations of universal ethics. It's natural for people to appeal to these universal principles to justify what they're doing, how they're administering their society, and to justify the conduct of their positive law. How do you tell the difference between a good law and a bad law, except by an appeal to some value or standard outside the law that you are judging? Take a simple example. How do you tell the difference between a good tax law and a bad tax law. Now you might say one's inefficient. You might say it doesn't raise revenue, it discourages incentive. There are a whole lot of <coughs> pragmatic reasons that will enable you to distinguish a good law from a bad law in the area of revenue raising. But suppose you had a tax law that was unfairly discriminatory. Suppose you said that's a really unfair tax law. To what standard of judgment would you be appealing outside the Income Tax Assessment Act? People often say a tax is a tax. It's either in accordance with the Income Tax Assessment Act or it's not. If it is in accordance with the Act, you've got to pay it. If it's not, you don't have to. If it's not, you don't have to pay it. But people complain from time to time that tax laws are bad laws, are unfair laws, are unjust laws. And when they do that, they can only argue their complaints by reference to some standard that must exist outside the Income Tax Assessment Act and by which they can judge the Income Tax Assessment Act. So the answer to Rabbi's question is, first of all, our positive law is suffused with values and principles that come from universal standards, universal ethics. And whether you find them in natural <coughs> law, in Noahide law, or more recently, in declarations of universal human rights. You're appealing to some standard outside uh, the positive law. And when governments enact positive law in the form of statute law, they often appeal to these wider principles to demonstrate that the law that they're enacting is a good law. And when courts interpret positive law that stands in need of interpretation or develop the common law, they often appeal to these universal standards to justify uh, their interpretation. Canadian writers on jurisprudence have coined a very apt description of the kind of society that we live in. They, they say we live in a culture of justification. By that they mean that people are no longer uncritically accepting of authority. They require authority to justify itself. And when people in authority, including judges, justify their exercise of power, exercise power they seek to legitimize what they're doing by justifying their decisions, by justifying their legislation, and still the most common method of justifying decisions, justifying legislation, justifying the exercise of power is to appeal to universal values. Thank you very much. The final question I'd like to pose relates to the theme of punishment. Now, it would seem and uh, this is to a degree, I'm not, I'm not, so, I'm not so clear how to delineate this in, in the tradition of universal ethics itself, except that 
Within, I, I do know that in Jewish law, for example, there were times when there was a, a uh, if, if social order is strong, there was a very strong interest in the atonement and the rectification and the rehabilitation of the perpetrator. Nevertheless, uh, the primary concern in, in, in punishment is, of course, to secure social order. Uh, now, when I, my question is broadly, to what extent is, our, is, is, is the attitude towards sentencing a function of the level of social stability? What I mean by that is as follows. In a situation where uh, societies face uh, instances of serious instability, and there's a considerable need for deterrence, one could contemplate and understand quite radical punishment or severe punishment. Within limits. As the society, uh, as society becomes is, is more stable, is morally, then perhaps the um, focus can be a little bit more on the individual. Perhaps there's more concern for the perpetrator, him or herself, and the rehabilitation of the perpetrator. Uh, but just to throw something else into the into the consideration, I was I, I, I was most interested in a statement which Mr. Gleason quoted in one of his essays, and it's a statement made by Justice James Wood. It says as follows, a myth which has been imposed on the police from the outside is the notion that police can and should, either through an increase in numbers or in the aggressiveness of their policing, prevent crime. Relentless law and order campaigns and attribution of blame to police for outbreaks of criminality are misplaced. The causes of crime lie elsewhere in the social and economic conditions of the time, in contemporary moral values, over none of which do police have any control. And to this, Mr. Gleason adds, it may be added that judges do not control these ma those matters any more than the police. So I would like to, to ask Mr. Gleason, um, what, are the, what are the variables? In, uh, what, what, how do we explain a, a sliding scale, if this is the correct term, between concern for the collectivity which the individual is seen, it has to be, is seen as having to be punished severely to maintain the social whole, on to the other extent where society can afford to become more concerned with the, uh, with the, the treatment which, 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 will, which will rehabilitate the offender. And prison is a difficult case here because I'm not really sure whether to achieve that at all, to what, to what extent it does. And, uh, and further, how do, we, to, to, how do we connect with those considerations the, the concern for getting to the roots of crime itself, which have to do with, uh, as you as, as pointed out in the paragraph which you quoted, the, the actual many cases, the, the breakdown in social economic conditions and the, co and the collapse, perhaps, <coughs> of the contemporary moral values. Without doubt, a summary and retributive form of justice is usually the product of circumstances such as a society that does have a problem of coherence, uh, a society that lacks the self-confidence in its own stability to adopt an approach of the second kind to which Rabbi Kalman referred. But we have within our own legal system a good example of the point that he makes uh, about the nature of the response of a criminal justice system to the circumstances of the society. Consider our military justice system. The idea of a drumhead court martial. Summary punishment, perhaps even to the point of execution in the past at least, uh, and in wartime conditions uh, in the present that may be administered. Where you're administering a form of justice that doesn't have the, the time or the opportunity to go into the refinements that we normally associate because of the pressure of circumstances and because of the risks involved in tolerating any kind of deviant behavior. And in war, in battle, you can't tolerate any kind of deviant behavior. Now Bismarck said, that military justice has the same relationship to justice as military music has to music. <laughs> uh, but all that is happening is that justice is being administered in 
vastly different circumstances with vastly different objectives. And then you get the awkward problem that arises when you're administering military justice in a peacetime situation where the kind of disciplinary problem that you have is not a soldier disobeying orders on the battlefield, but somebody on recreational leave going out and buying some drugs contrary to the local law, doing something that may not be radically different from what a lot of young people would do uh, back at, at home. There you have a problem with how the justice system should deal with that. Now, Churchill said that the way in which a society deals with offences against the criminal law is a mark of the civilization of that society. But it I might be equally true to say it's a mark of the self-confidence and maturity of, of that society, a developed society which has confidence in its own social cohesion that knows that the society won't break down if there is some level of tolerance of some level of deviance is likely to deal with offenders in a, a way quite different from the way in which a society that feels of deviation from uh, social norms uh, will react. Uh, it, it would be good if our society developed what I would describe as not more and more tolerance of deviant behaviour, but with more and more self-confidence in its capacity to manage deviant behaviour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have an opportunity to uh, take a few questions, if anyone has questions. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just interesting that you, you gave uh, an example about uh, the most common group of people who both commit uh, a violent offence and also who, who are victims of uh, violent offences, that being the group of people between 15 and 24. Male people, actually. Pardon me, sorry? Male people. Male, sorry, male people. <laughs> oh, I overlooked that, sorry. Male people between the age of 15 and 24. Um, one of the things I've noticed, because I do a, a fair bit of criminal work, and one of the things I've noticed in court is a different attitude that's taken towards violent offences and offences uh, in the nature of, of fraud and money type offences. Uh, and it seems to me that um, people who, the court takes one attitude in relation to violent offences and uh, I must say it sometimes surprises me, um, and I do a lot of defence work, um, in relation to the violent offences, just how tolerant and, and soft the courts are. I actually get quite, quite surprised. Get, Offences that don't seem particularly over, uh, odious to me. Um, fraud offences, for instance, I mean, obviously that depends on, on the scale and, and type, but uh, um, the court takes a very, very hard line in relation to those offences, often involving not great amounts of money. Uh, and often they're less inclined to look at the subjective circumstances of the person who commit, committed that particular offence. And it's interesting that the victims in those in the violent offences tend to be in that younger age group. So I, I just wonder if you could comment on this. Um, perhaps um, it, it's a case where the law, the laws that's been, that, that are being passed, and the approach that's, that's taken by people who are not in that age group because they're not actually they're less likely to be the victims of those particular offences in relation to the to the violent offences as opposed to the fraud offences. I think. Heavy punishments are often applied to some examples of what are sometimes called white collar crime or fraud on the social security system uh, or customs offences. Because offences, because what's going on is making an example of somebody in relation to conduct which is very difficult to detect. Customs offences are a good example of that. In practice, it's actually very difficult to detect people who break the customs law, so the courts have a long time taken the attitude that when they catch somebody who does, they're going to make an example of that person. Same with social security, <coughs> for example. Again, they're very difficult to detect, but when they are detected, uh, courts seek 
to, uh, to make an example. Uh, again, a lot of those offences involve a breach of trust. Well, the same applies to certain forms of violence, in particular, uh, in particular, uh, sexual offences against the minors, for example. They often involve breaches of trust, and that is uh, an aspect of the circumstances of the case that courts regard very seriously. And that's because to punish, to impose substantial punishment for a breach of trust supports the trust. It supports the system, a way of supporting the system that operates on trust. You take a, a solicitor who dips into a client's trust account. If there weren't severe punishments for conduct of that kind, that would be the end of having trust accounts. That would be the end of people proposing trust in solicitors. But look at the, look at the extent of the confidence that people place in the, the medical profession. Um, that patients place in the medical profession. And that confidence is perfectly well placed almost all the time. But the confidence is supported by a system that cracks down hard on doctors who abuse that confidence. So uh, these forms of punishment, it seems to me, are supportive of the system, ultimately. They're not mindless retribution. Just, um, I'd be interested in both of your comments, Rabbi Cowan and Mr. Beeson. I, I sometimes wonder, in my own work, um, in the areas of corporate governance and everything, that you know, Australia is a very law-based nation, um, and it served us very well. Uh, we've got a lot of law, and we appeal to law, and we create new laws for everything. But they were actually coming up again in a situation where um, there are limits to law. Um, anti-discrimination and those sorts of things you have to be there um, but behaviour at that level is very difficult to control and one of the most obvious examples recently is a law against high salaries um, which is you know, most of us are pretty appalled by all sorts of things but you know making a law that sort of fits the situation um, I wonder whether in Australia in fact we have got this situation happening whether it's our background or what I don't know if go into that and philosophise about that where um, the citizens, the parliament, we do have a knee-jerk knee reaction to constantly wanting a law against things rather than appealing to an ethical um, measure. And of course the law, you know, the judiciary and the courts can't deal necessarily, can't deal with those ethics issues. And that we, as life gets more and more complex in a very, very complex world, we're coming up against things where the law does have its limits. We've actually got to concentrate more on ethical development, ethical principles. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to because you asked me. <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> um, this, this, this theme um, is, uh, I, I think, actually it builds on what Mr. Gleason was just saying. In other words, when society wants to make a, when society wants to make a point, um, I personally think it's. It, I think it's very easily reconciled with the concept of uh, universal ethics. That, uh, that society ma society makes new ordinances. Now, those ordinances may not necessarily be of a, of a judicial, you know, of a more of a legislative uh, character, because it wants to bring the society to new levels of responsibility. And. Um, uh, if, I don't, if it does not do it in this way, how else can it do it? In other words, you're, you're asking, uh, you're suggesting that the society does not need to be educated so forcefully by legislation that we should come to it by ourselves. But in fact, I think, I think that the legislation is the most powerful and best way of education and to and actually find that edu the bad legislation has a huge legislative impact in the other way. The legislation always educates, but uh, but so therefore we have to, but, and, and it should educate in the right way. So I personally think that um, that's that is the way in which the point is made. That is where we do have ethical development through uh, through appropriate um, 
legislative reinforcement of, of, of values which society needs to have. I, uh, so sport is a dangerous analogy, and, and life isn't a game, but I, I do agree with your point which may be expressed by saying that you don't make a game fairer by constantly increasing the number of rules. I'm, I'm involved in business technology and I'm sort of a small, small business providing advice to very large corporates. And, and I guess my question is around affordability of, uh, of law and in commercial matters. Uh, there are organisations with substantial resources to use the courts for uh, resolution of uh, disagreements and there are many participants who are not quite so well funded unless the insurance companies uh, come to the party. And I, so I guess I'm interested in a more general question about the affordability of justice, not amongst those who, um, who would qualify for legal aid and not necessarily by those who have got the reserves to, to deal with it, but probably with a large number of citizens in the middle that might find any large legal proceedings pretty uh, devastating. Well, the unaffordability of justice is the greatest block on the justice system. Um, they, governments try to do better, courts try to do better, but it's the biggest failing of the system. No question about that. <coughs> um, I don't necessarily accept that um, it's the people in the middle who suffer disproportionately compared to others. Everybody suffers from it. Uh, but uh, when I was on the Supreme Court of New South Wales, we got the Law Foundation to do a survey. I'd heard people telling me over and over again that only the very rich and the very poor can afford to go to court. And we were inundated with cases. Huge delays. Vastly, the court was vastly overworked. And I couldn't reconcile that with the proposition that nobody can afford to go to court. <laughs> and the, the Law Foundation did a survey, and they found that the average income of plaintiffs in the common law division of the court was the same as the average income of the community generally. The explanation? Solicitors were doing cases of a certain kind on spec. In other words, no win, no fee. And that's why a certain kind of case, got to, namely actions for damages for personal injuries, got to court. Well, that's a very old-fashioned example now because although the courts in my day were in and there in cases like that, there aren't so many of them now for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. But the basis on which solicitors used to accept plaintiff's work in personal injury cases is a good example of one of the practical ways in which some of these problems are to some extent overcome. Another question in the back? The institution of marriage uh, is under attack, uh, if that's the right word, by clamouring for uh, gay marriage. <coughs> A uh, respected Jewish American philosopher, Joan Rivers, has said <laughs> it should be a gay marriage because why should gays be denied the uh, pain of an agony of divorce. <laughs> That's an external value that might uh, require uh, or support the uh, reassessment of what is marriage, which most of us think is a fundamental, foundational uh, element of society. Uh, but if sharing the pain of divorce isn't a sufficient external value to support a re-examination of the institution of marriage so that there can be gay marriage, what is? Well, um, the point is that it's an institution, not just a convenient form of contract. Let me take another aspect of the definition of marriage. It's the union of a man and a woman for life. Now, any contract lawyer will tell you there's an obvious 
alternative. <laughs> For three years, for five years, until she reaches the age of 40, there are many forms of contractual arrangement that you can enter into that are distinct from an arrangement for life. We all know that for life means indefinitely, not permanently, because of the operation of the laws of, of, of divorce. But if the institution itself is up for reconsideration, then why isn't that aspect of it up for reconsideration? Why do we accept that it's an aspect of the institution that's for life? Why can't you get married to somebody for five years? And why can't you get married to two people if there's no fraud involved? In our society, we often think of bigamy against a background of fraud or deception, but that, that's not necessarily the case. Why isn't there, uh, why isn't it an acceptable modification of the institution that you can have two wives at the one time. It's very interesting that there's practically no polyandry, so far as I can see, in most places <laughs> in the world. Why, why, but why are we limited to, to polygamy if we go down that path? That's why I said earlier that it's a pity that polygamists aren't a more politically active group in our community. <laughs> Maybe the time will come before very long when they may be. But if they were a more politically active group, then they would focus our attention on all aspects of the institution, how they got there and why they're there. You may know, I'm sure John McConaughey followed this event uh, closely at the time it happened, but about a year ago in France, uh, a traffic policeman saw a woman driving a motor car dressed in a burqa. And he said, hey, hang on, you can't do it. You can't see properly. That's dangerous. You can't look at cars coming behind you and so forth. So he stopped her and he said, I'm taking you home. I'm driving your car home. You're, you're unsafe to drive in that dress. And when he got her home, he found that there were three others just like her. And all of them had children. And there was one man there. And the penny dropped. And the policeman said, you're a polygamist. There's a law against polygamy in France, and I'm going to arrest you and charge you with polygamy. And the man may well have been prepared by his lawyer for this eventuality. He came up with a very good answer. He said, one of these women is my wife, and the other three are my mistresses. Since when has it been against the law in France? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We've, uh, we've come to the time for conclusion. I'd like Tim to be able to share a few.